Hello everyone, this is Ezekiel O'Callaghan with Raptor Chatter, here to talk about December 2018 in paleontology. A new ornithopod dinosaur, Weewarasaurus pobeni, has been described coming from Australia. The only fossil of it is a jawbone, however it was entirely opalized, which is unique. While opalized bones are occasionally found, they're normally of aquatic species, such as these plesiosaur vertebrae. But finding a dinosaur bone that has been totally opalized in this manner is rare, and it's one of the things that makes this fossil so unique. In addition, it was found in association with a few other ornithopods from the same region, which helps to show us what prehistoric Australia would have looked like, with the northern half of the continent being more prone to having larger iguanodontins and sauropods, and the south having the ornithopods, which were smaller. And this is important as this part of Australia was very close to the Antarctic Circle during the time, and so it does help to shape how life might change as Antarctica does warm up in the face of global warming. The media can sometimes take science out of context. As an example of this, this month a paper was published detailing how a shark fed upon a pteranodon, one of the large pterosaurs. The study looked at a series of vertebrae from a pteranodon which had a shark tooth caught inside of them. The paper goes into specific detail about how it was likely either a scavenging event on a pteranodon that had already died, or that the shark had taken it from the surface of the water, meaning that the pterosaur would have been on the water much like a modern day gull or pelican might sit. One of the paper's authors, Mark Witten, is known for his fantastic paleo art, and added one of his drawings into the paper. In the background of the image, you can see a number of the pterosaurs either taking off from the water or still in it, and the shark that has left the water was doing a breaching behavior, much like we see in modern day great whites. However, a number of news outlets, rather than fully reading the paper, decided to take this picture at what they assumed it was, a shark leaping out of the water to grab a pterosaur out of the air, which is not what was proposed in the paper at all. And this is one of the reasons we need to make sure we have proper education on the sciences, as paleontology as a field can be very easily misconstrued. Thiasileo was the marsupial lion of ancient Australia, and for a long time it's been considered one of the apex predators of the continent during the Pleistocene and before human arrival. But its exact behaviors were unknown. This is due to the very fragmentary nature of most of our fossils of it. However, a new fossil did show up, giving us a more full picture of the Thiolaceo's body type. Notably, it seemed to have a stiff tail so it would be able to kind of tripod itself and use its powerful front arms to carry itself up into trees or out of the caverns in which it may have lived. This potential tree climbing behavior may have allowed them to be somewhat similar to our modern day leopards, which drop from trees to land on their prey. And ironically, mirrors the modern day joke or myth in Australia of the drop bear. While not real, the legend and myth of the drop bears has warranted them their own joke entry on the Australian Museum's website and a competitive professional Overwatch team named after them. A well-preserved ichthyosaur was found with soft tissue preservation, such as skin, which shows that it was very smooth skinned, such as a porpoise or a dolphin. But even more surprising is that they had blubber. And blubber is a sign of being warm-blooded, as even today, only a few warm-blooded species have blubber. And today, these groups that have blubber are widely diverse. In the mammals, you have seals. In the birds, you have penguins. And in the reptiles, you have the leatherback turtle, arguably the only warm-blooded reptile still alive today. This shows that as much as life was different during the Mesozoic, there are still a lot of really good analogs and parallels we can bring to today, despite the fact that instead of dolphins, we had ichthyosaurs. The ankylosaurs were known for having hard bony plates which were used for defense. However, all of that armor did cause them some issues. Specifically, overheating. Due to their small brain size, their brains were more prone to overheating than that of other species. So in order to make sure they kept their heads cool, they developed longer nasal passages which winded and helped cool air as they breathed, therefore keeping their head much cooler than the rest of their bodies. This adaptation allowed them to reach such large sizes as in Ankylosaurus. Saltrio venator zanelli was a ceratosaurid, related to ceratosaurus, 
and it was notable that rather than being from the late Jurassic, such as Ceratosaurus, it was from the early Jurassic, being more contemporaneous with species like Dilophosaurus, which had previously been the first large theropod. Saltrio venator was significantly larger than Dilophosaurus, though, and its first steps towards the gigantism that we see in the later carnivores during the Jurassic and Cretaceous may have been one of the early pressures to cause the gigantism that we began seeing in the sauropods during the same time period. Saltrio venator also gives us a better idea of how bird hands might have evolved, specifically which of the three fingers might have become the bird wing. And this is because Limusaurus, which is also from the same clade as Saltrio venator, was previously used as an example of an early theropod hand. While from the same group of ceratosaurans, Saltrio venator had a much different hand than Limusaurus, meaning that our previous basis of Limusaurus as a primitive theropod hand may not be entirely accurate. And what this really means is there needs to be more research done. Saltrio venator was incredibly fragmentary and other fossils might be too, so it's always important that we're able to get out into the field and find new fossils that are more complete. Pterosaurs had feathers, or at least something incredibly, incredibly close to feathers. We've known that they had a type of body covering called pycnofibers for quite some time, but it's always been fairly small bits of fluff, rather than anything that could be definedly seen as something resembling a feather. Two new pterosaurs show these pycnofibers in incredible detail. Specifically, the detail in these feathers shows that there were four different types of them, showing how developed that they had become. This means one of two things. Either the pterosaurs evolved these feathers independently of the dinosaurs, and both the groups just happened to need a very similar structure for their own independent reasons. Or two, the common ancestor of the dinosaurs and the pterosaurs also had feathers. And that means all of its descendants might have feathers. Before you go around saying that all dinosaurs had feathers, there are issues with that idea. As an example, we have very, very good skin impressions of Edmontosaurus, and it didn't have any feathers. And for sauropods, we have almost no skin impressions at all, mainly coming from the inside of footprint fossils that we found. Jumping to conclusion based on these pterosaur fossils is the wrong thing to do. There's nothing to confirm in it that all dinosaurs had feathers, just that there's a chance that all dinosaurs had feathers. From my home state of Arizona, a new ceratopsian has been described, Crittenden ceratops Krizy Zanowski. It was a fairly small ceratopsian, being only about three to four meters, a far cry from the nine meter long triceratops. Its find really emphasizes the fact that you don't need to go to far off places to find new species, with this one being found just outside of Tucson, with a population of 1 million. Hi everyone, thanks for watching. We were finally able to get one of these out in a reasonable time, close to the beginning of the month. I should be releasing the year in review next week. And on top of that, at the end of the month, there should be a special announcement as well. Anyway, again, thank you for watching. Be safe, take care, don't go extinct.